Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, welcome everybody. It is a great pleasure for me to present Jesus Labarta from the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Jesus is going to be with us uh, today for the entire set of uh, four hours. Uh, he's going to be talking about STARS S, a new model for multi-core. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, you can come, that uh, we are doing this in parallel with uh, TechFest. And uh, these presentations are going to be taped. So please uh, tell your colleagues about them so that they can also see what's going on in Barcelona. And hopefully we will learn a lot from this presentation. Uh, thank you very much, and here's Jesus. OK. Thank you, Juan, and thank you, Microsoft, for the opportunity. No, I think I, ha I have the. Th thank you for the opportunity to come and present you the work that we have been doing for a few years now on programming models, and we think it's very appropriate for for the, the emerging architectures. I did propose an agenda, which while preparing the final slides, I've changed a little bit, but I think I'm more or less going to cover the, all the same topics as there. There is a little bit of extension in some of them, and uh, addressing a little, very, very slightly things like how this applies to Java, and uh, so I, I think it's more or less the, the same type of stuff for the, for the four hours, more or less. Just the, uh, in case you want to interrupt at any moment. I mean, it can be very dynamic. First, just to present a little bit in case you don't know, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center is a, a research and service center. It's an institution created by the Spanish Ministry and the Catalan uh, Regional Government plus the Technical University of Catalonia. Uh, there is uh, one of the functionalities is to give access or its uh, mission is to give access to uh, high performance computing resources. We have a large machine in Barcelona and we also handle a network all over uh, Spain. And this is done by the operations department in the uh, center. We have also a research branch which actually is actually four other departments. One of them is on applications. There's an applications which essentially is uh, mechanical, computational mechanical applications. There's people on life sciences, people on air sciences, and there's a computer science department which uh, I'm responsible for where we work on uh, low-level system software architecture and essentially a little bit this tries to cover a little bit these, these areas. We have a very large group uh, which uh, actually all this part, this part which is the computer science department, comes initially from the UPC, from the group of Matteo Valero, and essentially Matteo Valero is here, he's the director of the center, and he's the, art, art, the, 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 the creator of the center. Yeah? And his background, his interest has been always in, in computer architecture, and there's a big group of people working on different aspects of computer architecture. I am kind of the black sheep uh, there, because, well, I started working on, with him, but I moved more to the software side of the, to the dark side of the, of the, of the, the, of the computing area. And we have been working on things like programming models, like performance analysis tools, operating system, and uh, file system, th this type of uh, activities. What, uh, what I try to represent by the arrows here is we try, I, to what level we achieve that is, it's always difficult is to, to actually have as tight as possible cooperation and communication between the experiences, the experienced people in all these different, uh, these different areas. Okay? We try to, to have as much as possible cooperation. Anyway, what I will be presenting today will be work that continues the, the previous activities in, in, in programming models, which initially were centered mostly in OpenMP, and uh, we are now uh, going developing this this programming model that I'm talking about. So let me just start with uh, a first bibliographic note, which is you remember the book of Genesis when it says there was at the beginning there was one language, 
and then people said we can build bricks and with those bricks we can build the towers and we can reach uh, the skies and uh, what they got at the very end was the confusion of languages and well the very big expectations were probably not uh, met we're still alive we're still here but uh, probably we have suffered a little bit in the in the wave since then till now so why do i put this because i think there's a quite good analogy to the computer age computer world i think at the beginning there is one language and we come from a, a high performance and engineering type of, of area okay so it's probably our original narrows and in that field i think just standard C or Fortran standard imperative languages plus MPI is what is what is being used. We do think that we can build powerful bricks, multicores, and with those multicores we can build big towers. Okay. And uh, what do we get? We get the same thing. We uh, we get a whole lot of languages, a little bit uh, confusion, a little. Or, or not a little of confusion in, in on how to use this, these systems. But uh, like anybody else, I mean, we are just trying to put our piece of sand or our cont small contribution to this confusion of languages and we are, we are proposing yet, yet another one, okay? We do think it has nice features, but one that's also one of my interests, my objectives is to have feedback from you on what do you really think and how, whether it's interesting or not, or how can it be improved. Anyway, I'll be talking about this, this programming language, which we call STARS. And we call it STARS because from the asterisk uh, dot SS, SS comes from superscalar, and uh, the asterisk is because we actually have a single language, a single model, the user essentially, and the idea is single source code can run on different platforms by implementing different, by providing different implementations of the same programming model, different runtimes, essentially. So what we have implemented is a runtime for the cell, a runtime for a standard SMPs, a runtime for GPUs. We have a very, very minimal runtime for other accelerator devices. We are working on a runtime for a cluster so that you can run this same program on the, on the, on the cluster. And we have and these are, let's say, these are the fine grain, the idea we have, can apply the, the same idea, different granularity levels. These are the fine grain uh, implementations. Here we are talking about uh, a, a, a model where the granularity of the computations is, let's say, hundreds of microseconds. So it still is not the very, very, very fine grain, it's a medium, but it's hundreds of microseconds up to here. Here we would be talking about maybe millisecond, okay? And uh, here we are talking about, uh, let's say, seconds or minutes or hours. So different levels of granularity, but essentially same type of, uh, of uh, source. Up to here is certainly true that it's the same source. We want to, we want to run on these different platforms. This is, there, there are slight differences. I will not be talking about this, but uh, just in case you are interested, uh, Rosa Badia is coming here in, in two months from now, I think. She, in April, she's coming and she will be explaining this, this, this version. Okay, and as I said, the idea is, uh, is, is a programming model where you, is, you have just C or Fortran plus directives. It's a programming model that allows for incremental parallelization. It's Fortran and C, we would need a certain type of discipline, and I will show this through the examples, okay? It's, it's not any standard, a, a, any single C and Fortran program, but as long as you follow a certain methodology of programming is, is when you can apply this, this parallelization, which is automatic parallelization. So the intelligence, the way of determining what is parallel and how to execute that, that is determined by the runtime, okay? The, finally, at the very end, what, what this end re results is in a, a, a data flow type of execution of a task of a task uh, based um, program. Okay. We'll we'll come into the details. 
Uh, what uh, I had here first uh, was very small, some general discussions about programming models, what we think are two important components. One of them is how do you generate work and how you synchronize that to work. And in the typical, you have different typical approaches which, where you try to, or you could have nested for join, maybe silk, silk or um, just OpenMP. So the approaches where you just fork and join parallelism, that's one way of generating work, which then you have other approaches where you can actually just instantiate work, which then you wait for it. Or the approach that we try to follow where it's more a, a pure data flow graph where the explicit wait for the thing, the things, the waiting for things is in general not explicitly stated in the source code. Es essentially here, these type of approaches, we think you have to, yes, it's nice to fork work, but then you have to wait for it. And when you, in your program, specify the order of your waits, you actually have to, are actually assuming certain conditions about the scheduling, which might be right or might be not. So, essentially, our model ends up being something like a, 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 a generating a DAG at runtime of tasks. You generate the data flow graph and it is executed, just traversed by worker threads that uh, compute through, through it, just satisfying the dependencies. The other part of the, of the programming models that we think are really, or can, can, are really important, and actually memory has been really important in the past is, is the structure of the address or the address space. And here from, let's say, a simple structure of, of, of a serial program, uh, shared memory programming model or going to a message passing programming model, or even if you take a PIGAS with a part which is distributed and a part which is at least logically shared. That's some trend that we have had in the past, or, but with the advent of, of, of new accelerators and new devices and very intricate uh, architectures, we are going in a direction which is really, I would say, even in the case that you have, let's say, homogeneous multicores, actually the architecture does have different level of caches that has different mm, characteristics of, of access times, very NUMA type of uh, characteristics. So even in that case, but in general, I think that this, the structure of the address spaces is, is a really, is a really fuzzy space, is a really variable and a strange thing. And uh, I have a strong doubt of how much of that should we make visible to, to the programmers, okay? The idea does, so in the same way that I said before, for the control flow that we go towards data flow graph, to the, to the con word generation here, we try to stay at a flat lineal addressing view of the of a single lineal address space. Okay, those are the two the two major constraints. So of course we have to we have to offer that vision of the world to the programmer, and a different thing is how that gets executed on the real system. So I'm not going to well about uh, memory association, which is uh, just just more details on on that part of the of the memory address space structure. Just let me uh, put this, this thing because trying to design for such an environment of such a very different architect set of architectures and very said, so it reminds me of this type of, of joke where uh, Mafalda, well, this is an Argentinian, I don't know, character. character. And the, uh, what he said was, she tells to the guy, can you imagine if everything was here? If, if you have to, for which from my point of view is, if you have to design a, a holistic design of full system from the architectural to the programming model to everything, yes? And uh, if you have to think of all those many things, and there is all this, yes, the, 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 the most, uh, the easiest outcome of that is just shock, okay? Being shocked. So, we are in a little bit in this in this in this situation in this with this risk. Then, now going to the f a little bit the philosophical motivation of where we where do we where our programming model comes from, and probably comes from this from this consideration from this question is, is what is the difference between these three things? Okay, something which would be a superscalar processor, normal superscalar processor. In this case, is the processor in our Mare Nostrum machine, or the first of them? I, I think it's the, the current. One. I don't know. It's the current one or the original one. One of them. 
if we move, what, what is the, the different the relationship between that and um, in this case a cell chip with several uh, cores or a grid or uh, system, a very coarse grain, a very coarse grain system. And, uh, and the consideration is we shouldn't see, probably we, should, we see these things as very different, okay? And probably we shouldn't. Probably these three things, okay, are or should be seen as very much the same thing just if we look at them at the appropriate distance. If lo we look at what is done here at the level of nanoseconds and what is done here at the level of hundreds of microseconds or what can be done here at the level of minutes of hours, if we are able to see all these things as being essentially having the same structure, a unifying type of, of, of structure, of, if we are able to map concepts of things that happen in one, at, at one level to the next or to the next, we think that this this can give a, a nice unifying view of the of the of the of the of the universe let's say and will let us do one thing which is to leverage technologies and techniques that have been already done in the past in some of these levels apply them at a different level so what is the type of mapping that we are looking at well you have instructions here so an instruction could be considered as a block of operations uh, as a subroutine, as a task, or can be considered as a full binary. You have functional units that execute those instructions. You have cores that execute those operations or machines that execute those binaries. You have a fetch and decode unit, which could be one of the threads, one of the cores, or you have the host, the home machine. You have registers for, uh, for as a name space. Well, you can have an equivalent to registers, which would be name, name memory, or which could be files. Or you have registers as physical storage, and you have again the, 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 lock, the memory of the course, the local memory of the device, or, or files. If you can map this, the thing is, if you are able to look at the, at the systems at, different, uh, at those different granularities, our proposal is, these people, you have been doing, working and writing in sequential, and have been executing parallel for a long time, with several functional units, okay? You have, that, that has been done by the architect. So the proposal is just stay sequential in the way the program, even the way you write the programs, and uh, let or reuse, leverage the technologies or the techniques that have been used here in order to obtain the parallelism automatically. And that's the essential idea of the programming model. Just uh, from the point of view of our users, I think. Uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot change our, the mind of uh, We have our users are CM Fortran users, as I said before. They, they are now by now familiar with MPI, but we cannot change a lot their, their way of programming. We have a lot of, uh, of legacy applications that they have to maintain and update. So what we try to propose to them is to do some transformations, to work on some transformations, some restructuring, some better understandings of, of their inputs and outputs of their computations in their program, understand the potential asynchrony, but still write that, let, at least within the node level mod model within MPI, write that uh, on, on stars. A star should be able to let them specify these things in a relatively abstract level without going to the details of how those things are mapped to the actual devices. So uh, again, this, this picture you have seen, what is a stars? Essentially, the type of is a directive-based uh, model. So you take C plus directives, similar in, from this respect to OpenMP. Slightly or a strong, very different from OpenMP. The, essentially, there's, this is the main directive, uh, very different from OpenMP. OpenMP is something that says, this is parallel, go and execute it, or Silk, or many other languages. They say, this is parallel, go and execute it, okay? What we say here, we don't say this is parallel. We say this is the input of this task. These are the outputs of those tasks. I don't know whether it's parallel or not. Find it out. And if it's parallel, execute it. If it's not, wait until the dependencies are satisfied. Just a little bit of history. Well, this is prehistory, the, where the original teen ideas for this uh, work activity has uh, when grow, uh, grew up. We first did a grid superscalar implementation. Uh, 
for the grid, then we are come to uh, with different variations or different evolutions of our research activity. That is the first uh, wave of effort, let's say. Then we have a second wave of effort, which is we have had people working on OpenMP and developing an OpenMP infrastructure, which are kind of, uh, they contributed very significantly to OpenMP 3.0 by proposing the tasks, extensions to OpenMP. So what they have done, now, what they are doing now is coming back and try and collecting what we think are the best experiences for all these different areas. And they are trying to, well, uh, to integrate that and make this, the, the proposed directives of STARS to check how they merge, how they combine into OpenMP. The idea is try to evolve in this direction of trying to capture as much as possible and see what, what can be integrated into OpenMP because we see that as a potential way of promoting and, and, and extending and sort of making, surviving the, the approach of, of the STARS. If we were able to bring behind OpenMP. Of course, that's, that's a challenge, that's, a, that's a, and nevertheless the type of activity that we think, the type of work we'd like to, to do. So not only OpenMP, we are also looking at things like uh, transactional memory. As I said, the difference here is essentially mostly OpenMP says this is parallel go and execute it. And here we say uh, this is, uh, this uses those inputs, these inputs and these outputs and you have to find out whether it's parallel or not. We also see that there are some potential benefits or uses in, in transactional memory. So we essentially in this merge towards a future OpenMP standard, we would like to explore the, the merge of these, of, these three, of these three things. Our OpenMP environment, just, just to name it, the compiler is named Mercurium and the runtime which is named Nanos. So it actually supports OpenMP, as I said, supports, uh, is grabbing stars, yes? What is the name of the blue? Sorry? The blue, the meaning of the blue. The blue here, the colors? Yes. Uh, the blue, I think, is the, the, are the things, this is the different levels of, of progress and the, the things that are relatively advanced or quite advanced. Is, is in blue, okay? And this is an old uh, slide, I, I call it the cauliflower, yes, and it's, a, it's, it's, an, old, uh, it's an old one, it's, it's not the recent one. I just wanted, the, the, tipo, the people, I, I certainly do think that our best programmers are working on this, okay? Are, are the ones that are, we have, the best we have are just grabbing, time, kind of uh, catching up what the, what the others have been experimentally testing and putting that into really what we would like to be a really future uh, infrastructure. We have done examples like, for example, also texting Chapel on top of the runtime. There, there's, I, I have a lot of uh, confidence that this will be very interesting infrastructure. So, having said so about the the a little bit the, the 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 environment where we are and the type of uh, motivation and and, and uh, ideas and history of the model. Just let me go into a little bit more of detail of what the model uh, looks like. And the idea is that you take a, a C program, for example. It's a normal C program, relatively normal. Okay, it's, why? Well, it's, it's blocked, okay? This guy, in order to add two vectors, is doing that in, in chunks of block size by block size, okay? And actually, for each of these blocks, it's actually calling a function for doing that uh, that uh, that operation, okay? So it's relatively normal. It's the type of things that you can ask a programmer saying, well, try to block, to introduce blocking in your program. This is one dimensional blocking. You would probably recommend them to do two dimensional blockings, but it's the type of things that you would recommend. This is a, a sequential program. You do add two vectors, then you compute the reduction, you compute the, the, the sum of all those components, you scale something, okay. Uh, this is a standard C program. What do we need to, to taskify it and to convert it into a potentially parallel program? We need to add these directives which I showed before with the inputs and outputs, okay? So you say for these arguments, A and B are inputs, C is an output. For these arguments, A and some are inputs and B is an output, okay? You specify for each task what are the inputs and what are the outputs. And this is what the programmer specifies. 
So what happens is, at, well, our, we have a source-to-source -source compiler. We take this, we translate this, where we substitute the actual invocations of the tasks by a task to a runtime. And what the runtime does is, when you execute the program, what the runtime does is, based on that information and based on the actual values that are passed to the, to the actual invocation, the runtime builds something like a dependence graph. Okay? Instead of executing the task, instead of executing the addition, it just creates a node saying, I should add these two things. And because I know what the inputs and the outputs are, I know the inputs and outputs, and I can, while I enroll, this is, I keep enrolling this, this task graph, while I do that, so that enrolling, I, I am able to compute the dependencies. For doing that, I have to, I have to compare for every individual task, every time I, I instantiate one task, I, the, I, when I instantiate this task, I have to check what are the input, its inputs. I have to compare that to all the outputs generated by all previous tasks, okay? So it does have a certain overhead, okay? One has to try and do that in an efficient way, but it, it can have a certain overhead. But that's essentially what I do. I build a dependence graph at runtime based on that, specific, on that uh, specification of what are inputs and what are outputs. In this, in this plot, I, the numbers represent the order of instantiation of the tasks. And the good thing here is this is your sequential program. So this is actually specifying the sequential order of your computations. It's always a fallback position. You could always execute that task graph serially, and it would be just the same, the same sequential program. Yes? Uh, do you do anything about uh, non-declared dependencies that may exist in, in, in those functions? OK, our initial programming model definition is Everybody, every argument should be, uh, should be, you should specify the directionality and you should have, uh, you should be, you shouldn't have no side effects. This is our, our original. We are relaxing that in, and I will be talking a little bit about, about that, okay? But the original approach is just, is just this pure functional, let's say, this function, pure functional approach, okay? Okay, so, yes? You said that the graph gets built at runtime, so does that mean that I can potentially generate or create new nodes on my graph based on the output of previous ones? For instance, if there was a condition on one of those loops that was a, that was a result of one of those loops didn't execute if one of the, the previous loops had some particular result, say the accumulation was zero. Yes, essentially yes. Okay, there, there, there are issues out there about whether there are control uh, dependencies to the main program or not, okay? Because you see what we build here, we build dependencies between tasks, but the main program keeps, keeps going. And from time to time, maybe the main program needs the output of one of those, okay? So we still have an issue of synchronizing the main program to the, to the, to the task, okay? But, it's, a but, but it's, it's totally dynamic and you should be able. And actually, essentially, this is, that, that's why it comes to the superscalar. Essentially, what, what, is, what is this? The, here you are defining the ISA of the machine. Okay, these are these are the instructions, and what you are doing here is you are unrolling those instructions. You are you are, you have an instruction window which can be you, in the same way that the superscalar processor keeps filling the instruction window on one side and keeps emptying it on, on on the other. Probably the only difference is that here you can build because this, the instruction window is actually in memory. You can build instruction windows of forty thousand tasks instead of. 100 instructions or 200 instructions, okay? So you can do huge levels of look ahead and huge levels of, of parallelism, but essentially it's the same idea of the superscalar. How, how do you handle the nesting of tasks? In this initial approach, as we have, there is no nesting. I'll be talking later about some approach and experiments that we are doing about nesting. I have, I have a few presentations about it, a few slides. Exceptions, uh, you would have to simulate something, to, to mimic something like precise ex uh, exceptions, yeah, precise interrupts. And as of today, as of now, we, the, we have not looked much of that. And this is certainly a, a potential problem, okay? We have in, uh, you could do things, with, I'll, I'll talk about merging with transactional memory. We have in, on the grid superscalar version, we do have some treatment for, for, for example, for toll fault tolerance failures, okay? So we know at that level, we know essentially what, how much have you really graduated, and we can stop and, and essentially squash and, and eliminate the, all the tasks that have, on, have already been executed 
but are uh, not just a so, so, if you have between this task and, and this other task, some other task that in the sequential order was there, but you have not executed it, so these ones you have to squash. And this is the one that fails, you have to squash those. We have done a little bit of that on the, on the grid, on the, at the grid level for fault tolerance, okay? But it certainly is one of the issues because actually what, uh, what we are doing is out of order execution. And as of today, we are actually, for this moment, we are actually doing graduation out of order, okay? Which is, yeah. Um, so, do you assume like there's no aliasing between the input or between the input uh, We have also been talking about it. There are essentially two versions of the, uh, as of today, between two versions of the, of the runtime. Well, one thing is aliasing in the sense that if you say if this argument is the same as that one, okay, that would be one level of aliasing, which I don't think is is very difficult to handle. Or is more difficult, and we are dealing is what happens if some of these arguments address a given part of the data and the others have partial partial overlap, or we also have another issue, which is this is for this is vectors. Okay, what happens with matrices if the matrices are two-dimensional? Obviously, they are actually they are actually stored as um, strided in memory. Okay, and we have to compute. We have you would have to compute the dependencies for something. Here is in the very simple question is maybe not that difficult. You have an address and a length and you can do that. With the strides, we have already done some of that. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be talking. Okay? So essentially the thing is, some of this, well, you have the, the graph and roll, you compute the dependencies, some of those are anti-dependencies, okay? The thing is, you can then execute that graph, and here the color and the number represents what happens in the first cycle, for example, what happens in the, what is executed in the second cycle, what, and as I said, we execute totally out of order, okay? And uh, the idea is, yeah, to decouple the way you write from the, from the, way, you, from the way you execute. You can write in, in a more, let's say, more natural way for a programmer, and you can execute in the way that is most appropriate for the machine. So, as a summary, what are the, the two characteristics, I think, of, of our approach, of, of the idea of specifying the, the in and out directives? And if you look at other approaches for, for, for programming accelerators, for example, many of these people do specify also inputs and outputs, okay? But f for inputs and outputs, there are essentially, in, in this context, there are essentially two, two, two uses. One of them is to determine dependencies at runtime, which is what we do. And the other thing is to do data transfers, okay? Most of the, or the other approaches essentially what, what do is just use these inputs and output statements or, or, or clauses to uh, specify how to do the data transfers. In this approach, one of the key components is, is the use of these inputs and outputs to compute dependencies, okay? This is one of the, one of the, one of the key important uh, benefits of, of the input and output approach that we're looking at. And the other one is that you specify, you are also specifying what is the data that you use on those tasks, okay? So the runtime does have information on what data is used by the, by the, by the system. So the runtime can do optimizations on the way the memory, the physical memory is handled, okay? So as example, for example, you have opportunities for prefetch. This is you know for all of these tasks, you know what are the arguments because you have unrolled that and assume that the tasks take a certain amount of time so while you execute the first one, you have probably unrolled thousand more tasks. You, you know why, what all those tasks do require as input. So you can, if you combine this with the scheduling, you can say, well, I, if I know where I'm going to schedule this task, I can start bringing this data. This is the prefetch capability. The reuse is well, if I schedule this data in one processor, I know that it would be good to schedule this other task in the same processor, in the same core, because this, it's reusing the data. So if it's a cache-based system, the data will probably be in the cache. If it's not a cache-based system and I have to do the transfer explicitly, probably I can save those, those transfers. So then the, the, with the information of the memory access patterns, then what you can actually couple is the scheduling and the, and the memory or, and the, for, for parallelism, for concurrency, and the scheduling for, for memory for locality. Other type of things that you can do is, if you have antidependencies, 
or output things, you can actually apply the same techniques that are that are applied in superscalar design. Okay, you can use renaming. The only thing is you don't rename now. You don't rename registers now. You rename whole chunks of memory. Okay. And essentially, what you end up doing is is the same thing. Is is design a, a processor, a superscalar processor at the coarser granularity granularity level. Just another comment of, of a new clause that was not mentioned before, which is the, in some cases, for example, in the example you saw before here, we had a, there was a reduction, so there was an input-output argument which was accumulated, and this is kind of setting up a, a very strong order between those tasks, while conceptually, essentially, the operation is commutative. Okay, So if the operation is commutative, probably one can specify that in a different way. We are using now the clause reduction, which probably is not a, per, a very good name because reduction or reductions as taken, for example, in OpenMP mean essentially two things. One thing is commutativity and the other thing is atomicity of the, of the updates. Okay? And the way we specify we use reductions is just for the commutativity. Okay? We leave to the internal of the task, to the actual implementation of the task, to do the atomic, to handle the atomicity in the way that is appropriate for that specific task. So our, essentially our, this clause, what this clause says is that instead of having these dependencies, this serialization, it actually encapsulates all the tasks that access this data. Okay, All the tasks that access this data just encapsulates them in a way saying any order of execution of those tasks is valid. The only thing is I need all of them to be finished in, because I need all of them to have the final data to have been produced <coughs> in, in order for later use of that data. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a, a way of specifying a par parallelism between those tasks, apart from the, from the data, from, the, from that specified in, in, the, in the graph, specifying parallelism between those tasks, but just by determining as long as some tasks keep accessing a variable with this reduction clause, where irrespective of these tasks are executed or instantiated very close together or very far away from each other, they are just considered as commutative. They can execute it, can be executed in any order. And we do think this is, this is an, interesting, uh, an interesting mechanism for, for many codes. <coughs> so, what do we need? In order to execute this thing, of course, we need to represent the argument references and, and how to go from the represent for the in-out specification, for the syntactic specification, the source code to the to the internal representation, and this can be exact an exact approximate has to do with this issue that we mentioned before about aliasing or not. We need a way to store all in-flight references because for every new reference that we create, any new task that we create, we have to compare it with all the previous with all the previous one. Then we need a task graph to represent all the generated work under dependencies that we have computed. We need to control the storage. If we apply those renaming techniques, we, we must know what are the different versions of the different objects and which task uses which object. And then essentially we just need a ready list, let's say, with which points to the ready task in the task graph, and it's just a matter, the execution is just a matter of you grab, essentially, conceptually, you grab one task, execute it, and that frees another one, and you keep executing. That's how the engine progresses. How do we implement that, this, this functionality, on the cell, for example, and this is the cell superscalar version of the runtime? Well, essentially, we have the main program, which is the, the main code with the call substitute, original code substituted by calls to the runtime. This is kind of the fetch unit, fetch and the code unit of the of the of the superscalar of the cell superscalar processor, and essentially keeps adding tasks to the graph. And in this case, if you do a very eager renaming approach, it is this guy can actually do start also do the renaming. The, the cell has two threads in the main in the in the main core, so we use the second thread as a, a scheduler thread, well, as a helper thread. It doesn't go it, well. It's, it's not the typical probably helper thread that you see in architecture. It doesn't it doesn't go before the origin the real one. It goes a little not doesn't go a little bit before. It goes a little bit behind, and it just tries to to 
traverse the task graph and find out what can be scheduled, what can be executed, build it. Actually, we build bunches of that in order to reduce overhead. And then sends that to the SP, to the slave uh, cores. The slave cores, there is a very small runtime here, which essentially for every task grabs in the arguments, invokes the actual task, task execution, sends out the results, and then notifies the task graph that uh, the task has been executed. So its, descend it's de descendants can be, can be uh, freed, can be put to the ready list if uh, they have no more dependencies. So uh, this is what is done here. It's also possible to do double buffering, for example, because when we, what we send from, from the, the helper thread sends from, uh, to, the, to the SPUs is, is not only one task. You can send a bunch of tasks seven, eight, not many because the very strong limitation of the cell is the size of the memory here, okay? That, that limits your granularity, that's, that's a limit, important limit. But if not, you can send, well, in our case, I think we do have bunches of uh, eight tasks. We send eight tasks and the runtime here can, while executing one task, start prefetching the data of the next one, if there's a space in memory and all, all those things, okay? So this is done totally, totally automatic. Well, this is on the on the, the cell superscalar version. What is what happens for the GPUs? And the GPUs essentially what happens is that the, the the device is not is not as flexible, so cannot do much of the handling of this data dependence and things like that. So essentially, put on the host a slave thread for for every device. We put a slave thread that is actually accessing in the host the main memory of the host and accessing the data structures that represent the graph, and it does a kind of self scheduling. Okay, from, from that graph. What do we do in, in, for an SMP? For an SMP, because every, every server, every slave thread has access to the main memory and every slave thread has a processor which is fully functional, well, it can actually, itself can actually access the data structures that represent the graph. It can actually start getting, grabbing tasks from the, from the ready list. And you can do things for locality, less, the typical things that you have in Silk of, uh, of uh, work stealing, for example. Well, well, you can apply the same philosophy as Silk. Okay? It's work stealing, you, you do a LIFO type of uh, insertion for your local things and you steal from the end of, the, of, that, of that queue. It's slightly different than in Silk in, from the point of view that now the task in, in Silk is, well, every time you spawn a, a new thread, you say this is work that can be done, this is work that can be done, and is put into the, into the ready queue. In our case, whether the work that can be done has actual, the work has actually been generated before, and what you just do, what each of these uh, threads does is when it finishes one, looks at the task graph and finds out, well, the execution of this one frees those many. So those many are the ones that I put into my, into my local queue. Well, there are many issues here, whether I put all of them, not all of them, but these are implementation, implementation issues. The, the, the idea is that this, the, super, the, the SMP can execute the, the same type of code as, as the GPU and as the, as the cell. So just, just to show some numbers, Essential. I, I will go into more detail of some of those, but you can execute, for example, this, these are numbers on the cell. This is Cholesky, which is, is not only matrix multiply, it's a little bit more, well, it's a triangular type of computation. Dependencies are a little bit more complex, uh, but nevertheless, you can still achieve 140, 150 gigaflops, okay? Uh, very elaborate, and this is a very simple source code, a very elaborated, very hand optimized and with a lot of effort, maybe you can get 170 or something like that, okay? On the GPUs, just to show that even for this case also, you can, you can actually use several GPUs and you can still achieve a speed up. I'll come, I'll come to all these numbers a little bit more in detail. This is on the SMP, on the SMPs, one thing that we are also trying is, well, for example, we should be able to write an SMP superscalar version of Limpack, for example, okay, which would be just yes, using the share, share memory single process Limpack with uh, SMP superscalar. Actually, these are, run, these are numbers from uh, an Istanbul, dual socket Istanbul, okay, and uh, this is the performance with the MPI plus OpenMP version on that. 
This is the performance of the MPI version. This is a, a little bit better. And typically, OpenMPI plus OpenMP, the problem OpenMP has is, is, is too synchronous, too much, too many barriers, too many barriers. And these barriers, if you even mix in, in a hybrid mode MPI plus OpenMP, these barriers at the OpenMP level, at the node level, do propagate their, their perturbations, their, their weightings to other processes. And that, that's the, the, the major reason for this. What we have here approach is, is gaining, a, is, well, the numbers, you see where it starts, yeah? but, but the, num the numbers is small, but at these levels of performance is, 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 is important. And what, we, what happens in our case is essentially that you essentially unroll the whole task graph of the, of, the, of the limp computation, and you just traverse it in a very asynchronous, very erratic way. Every process goes and grabs work as much as possible. And this is seen a little bit in our, these are traces of we can instrument the actual execution and we can, we can display timelines where we see for every thread what the, what the thread is doing. Well, these are two with two different colors, but essentially, what it here you see what it represents is this color represents you are doing the updates in the impact of the trailing song matrices. This color represents you are doing a factoring. Okay, so it's actually computing the factorizing the panel and, and broadcasting, doing the raw computations associated to that. What 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 we see essentially is that it's very 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 dynamic. Or this is another example with different colors, but that it's it's, it's very dynamic. Okay, you essentially feel the. The, the different threads more than a version which would be more synchronous, more just to show the same similar numbers. If you have, this is, this is on uh, Nehalem, there's an, an error here. This is the same, this is on the Istanbul. This is even on Enaltix. One of our look concerns was, well, uh, yes, you can do that maybe if your machine is very, very Yuma or very small, okay? and this dynamic execution doesn't hurt your performance very much. Whether you run here or you run there, you run there is not a big problem. But if you have a, a NUMA machine, uh, or well, then accessing remote data or accessing local data is, is very different. And if you have this, this very dynamic scheduling, you will be probably be accessing remote data. So the question is, to what level are, we able to, are you able to compete in a shared memory machine, which is heavily NUMA, are you able to compete with LIMPAC? Okay, and at the end, we are we are now in this situation on on Enaltix. This is 64 CPUs, so eight. Uh, this is 32, 32, no, uh, 16, uh, 16 clusters, 16 nodes, each of them for <coughs> four cores, and we are still able to do this this improvement over Limpack. And re recall that in all of these plots, you know, I'm improving over Limpack, and I'm doing that at very small problem sizes. Okay, if you go here, all of them, all of them, uh, we will not improve over Limpack. When do we improve over over the over the HPL, the, the over the, the code, is at the small problem sizes. Is where you you are in conditions where your granularities are small, your your computations are small, where your communication is significant compared to your to your communication, and that's where you achieve the overlap between communication and computation, and that's where asynchrony pays you. At the very high end, if you run large problem sizes and you run for hours, then the, the communication in Limpack in this case is, is relevant compared to computation. So the only thing that matters is the performance of the of the processor. But these are very small runs, and these are runs, uh, these are just a few seconds or a few uh, a few minute runs, okay, of Limpack. And what we think is, it's an uh, indication that, uh, well, of the interest of the model, because we think that in the future, this, this thing that we have been doing of, of weak scale in our applications will not be there, will not be the case when we go to exascale. Exascale, we think, will be more strong scaling type of situation. Communication will be relevant compared to computation because, I mean, you can keep if you do a weather model, you can keep doing finer and finer and finer and finer meshes, but there's a point when there's no physical sense in doing that because your physical models that you put into the application, into the application, then do not model the behavior at those granularity levels. So weak scaling will not be possible. Just blindly apply weak scaling will not be possible at a very large scale. So this is what we try to say under conditions of a strong scaling, of a small problems that you have to run on, 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 on large number of cores, 
and uh, we we have seen very interesting results for for this uh, hybrid API plus SMP superscaler. Well, I, I think that well, I had a little bit about the compiler infrastructure. I don't, don't think I'm going to say much. It's just it's just a source to source compiler. If you have accelerators, you have to separate the code from uh, what goes on the host and what goes to the to the device because you have to pass that through different backend compilers and 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 then at the end you have to merge all those things. Essentially. Well, it's just a little bit of, of general compiler infrastructure and then essentially at the end what happens is you just get get the binary that you obtain by linking your runtime library that you have implemented and this is specific for every dev, for every system. Okay, for a cell is one runtime library, for the GPUs is another, for the SMP is another. You merge that with your with your code from the from the different uh, uh, both from the host and from the and from the device and, and you get the binaries. I don't think this is much more uh, need to, to go in very detail on that. So up till here was the, the kind of the general the general view and now is goes a little bit into your question about what with Elias is, what with so what we have is different versions of the of the runtimes. Essentially we have this this SMP superscalar or and the version one which would be let me put it this way we have version one which is we assume what you said we assume that the the we have three three implementations in version one essentially version one is because for the com the, the differentiation between version one and version two is the, the the way of computing dependencies so here we assume that all the references are to contiguous pieces of data so it can be of any length but it's a contiguous chunk of data. Your input is a con or your output is a contiguous chunk of data. And we don't allow partial, partial aliasing. The aliasing has to be total. So if, and that's how you compute the dependencies between these things. And we have this. So based on this mechanism to compute dependencies, uh, we have a cell superscalar, which runs for the cell. Of course, it has to be purely functional. There, every argument has to have its inputs and outputs. And uh, and well, we have, because of the memory is very small, and we have a partial escape in there because you can provide an API on the device that can load and store by, through DMA from main memory. But that is going out of the main program and the main programming model ideas. And so essentially the idea is to keep it purely functional. Here you can have access to local store. Uh, sorry to load that with through load and store to, to global memory on the SMP because this is this is for the SMP and uh, essentially still here we because we are we are forcing to specify for every single argument the directionality clause in order to compute the dependencies based on all of them and the GPU superscalar is like the cell superscalar very much the same then we have a second version that supports in the way of computing dependencies it supports strided arguments so references that are arguments that are sub blocks of a larger data structure and partial aliasing between these between these references so you may have a more complicated uh, dependencies between them and then what i said uh, finally nanos is 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 a is a way of integrating some of these ideas into openmp and here you have uh, issues of uh, I'll talk a little bit about them later, probably just just to mention that the current status is this is very close, very close to catching up with the version one, not not with this version. Okay, this is a bit more complicated, but this is very close to catch up the the version one. So the idea would be to look at version one, and this this is what I have just mentioned. Okay, we are forced if you have different tasks, and this is the address space. The, the arguments can be blocks of contiguous data of any length. So this is, and I am representing, this is an input and this is an output of this task. This is an input and this is an output of this task. Okay, and here this is an input output and this is an input. So I'm representing tasks as they are generated. And essentially what we have to do is for any new task that I want to execute, I have to check if its, if its arguments have been referenced in the, previous, in the previous task in order to compute the dependencies. This is this is the, the the functionality that has to be that has to be achieved. 
Well, just the directives essentially let me. Oh, this is a little bit. The structure, the data structure for implementing that is, is just very simple. The table that we have just has uh, uh, the address, the logical address. With the hash, you get the logical address. And for each logical address, you have representations of the of the objects. Because we have renaming, every time you rename an object, you act essentially generate a new descriptor for it. And you essentially, if you do a very eager renaming, you do allocate the memory for that instance of the object. Okay. And at the same time, you use this information to build to build the data flow to the the, the, the task graph. So this is what a little bit just about the type of things that are handled inside the inside the library. And what I had here was more or less just examples on the use of the on the use of the model. Okay, I had uh, different examples. My idea was to go up to the probably I'm, I'm getting late. Maybe let me see. Let me try to see some, some of them a little bit. For example, uh, the first thing here is these are ways of specifying the, 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 the directives. And this is one valid way, and this is another valid way. Essentially, they are saying the same thing. C, here you're saying C is input output, and here you say the size of the objects. So from from, the declara from this declaration, the compiler gets information about the size of the objects and about their directionality. This is also valid. And essentially, what it means is, well, you have well, you have barriers, and by the way, you have barriers because of essentially because of timing purposes. In this case, just to be able to time, because if not, the program goes through here and finishes before actually executing. So you essentially the runtime computes the dependencies based on this annotation. Computes the dependencies between between the different between the different tasks. Okay, these four tasks and their dependencies. What we said also before, maybe sometime the the program needs the main program needs some of the results, but doesn't need everything of the results of those computations. Maybe needs only a little bit of the value of f, which has been produced here. And here we need it in order to print it, for example. Okay, so you can you have this other directive which we cannot mention. It's a weight on f, and waiting on the value on the value of f, and it's kind of putting a barrier here. The main program stalls here. The main program does not generate any further any further task. It's just stalling here, and then until the value of this of this uh, argument here has been produced. When, it, when it, that value is produced, it is used, and the program continues generating tasks, keeps going generating tasks. Okay. When the program is, when the main program is, main process stalls here, typically if it's uh, if it's on the uh, on the SMP superscalar, for example, that thread can go and help the others in in, tra in executing the task graph. Yeah. If it's on the cell, well, that cell is the, the thread, the main thread, essentially stalls there and waits. Wait till the till the dependencies are satisfied and it can continue. Well, this was just to say that there is a Fortran binding also, but let's go to other examples. So I have another example here about matrix multiply for it, which is essentially you do a three-level nested block a nested loop, which the the storage for this matrix is stored by blocks. Okay, so you have a matrix of pointers to the actual small blocks of block, block size by block size. So this is your matrix multiply code that traverses the, the, the high level hyper matrix structure. And every individual task is just the standard matrix multiply code, which might not be very efficient if it's only like this, but which you might provide different or alternative implementations for this, for this part. The only thing, uh, this is the source code that should run on matrices, will run on matrices of any size, will run on any number of cores or devices, okay? Which is typically a problem if you run OpenCL codes or you run or you write other, other type of programs. Sometimes they are too specific to only run on device and limited, for example, by the amount. They transfer everything to the memory of the device and, and if your data structure is larger than that, you cannot run it. Or if you want to run on several devices, you have to explicitly Write uh, well, handle all those devices independently. Here, you just is the same source code. So, like, on different number of calls, the number of partition will be the same. Is it defined by the uh, the number of tasks? Yes. The block size, 
block size is defined by the program, yes. So that's so that if you're running on one or one of your core, then the number of the tasks will be the same. The number of tasks will be the same, and maybe if you run on 100 cores or, or in a thousand cores, you will not have enough tasks for a given problem size, yes. So the idea is, but th this is just, can be a defined, but this can, this can be a, a, this can be actually a, a variable itself. You can pass here even the, the block size as an argument, and it works also. So you, you can adapt the granularity. And again, also the granularity is there. In some, in some machines, block size has to be small, like on the cell, because it doesn't fit in memory. And for GPUs, block size has to be large in order to, yeah? So program you do the job. You need to do the job, but it's much simpler than with any other approaches. It's just, it's just before invoking the call here, you would put block size equal something, and that's what you would have to change, okay? And we have not done it, but what that lets you do is, is something like, in the same way that you have, for example, in um, Sequoia, you have tunables, okay? Which say this variable, you tell the system, do whatever you prefer, whatever you like. We could have something like that. But it would be even more dynamic than in Sequoia, and Sequoia is very much, very static, very much compile time thing, okay? This could be much more dynamic. So how would you, the same source code, same source code would run on the cell. And yes, would run, but if you give this to the back -end, cell backend compiler, your performance is going to be miserable, okay? So for the cell, you probably need a better implementation of the, of the actual task on the very small block uh, computations. So essentially, what do we do? We essentially take, we, you leverage existing kernels. We take something from the SDK distributed by IBM or some, some version which is, is horrible in terms of, of writing. And that, if you want to do, for, that's our philosophy, you want to do for a, for a given architecture, for a given core processor at the, the, the tasks, that's either a job of the, of the backend compiler, if it was good, or of the, of the of the user to provide a better version. So on on uh, CUDA, same thing. You can use on a, on an NVIDIA. You can use Kublas. You can, if you want to optimize for those things, you you have to provide a Kublas Kublas version. Other alternatives would be, for example, to take the source code this source code and pass it through a compiler that can do some type of transformation. You can take HMPP, for example. And it can do on rolls, it can do, and it can generate backend code for, for an NVIDIA, which is relatively good, quite good. So you could have a more general purpose version than, than just this, which is just CUDA or just HMPP, which is valid for CUDA, but it's also valid for, for other backend devices. And we, the way we see it as a backend compiler for, for the actual ta optimization of the task computation. When we run this, this CUDA thing, for example, because we have our instrumentation mechanism, we also, this is timeline, these are four GPUs, and what the four GPUs do, and what we have in yellow is the data transfers, and in brown are the task executions. So one thing that you see here is, unfortunately, for some reason, first, the data transfers do not overlap with the, computa with the computations, and this is a problem of the, of the actual machine where we tried that, which does not support it, but later versions should support that, and future versions will support that. But there's another problem, which is also interesting. So that's the first one. And the second one is also, unfortunately, everybody goes into data transfers at the same time, and then everybody goes into computations, and then everybody goes into data transfers. That, that's, again, a problem which if we were able to skip, this, this is a histogram of the duration of the data transfers. If you are alone, this is your bandwidth in gigabytes or whatever it is. If, if there are several guys doing the same access, the bandwidth is, is a little bit less. And if there are four guys, the bandwidth is a little bit less. So what we see is that the, the system has a, a kind of self-synchronizing effort. And this is because of the nature of the algorithm, because all the tasks are of the same size and the arguments are of the same size. And because of the nature, the runtime could counteract that. If you in the runtime were able, like, for saying, well, let's put a, a, a limit on the number of uh, trans simultaneous transfers that I will be doing, the, the runtime would actually skew this thing automatically. Just to mention, you, you can run the same source code essentially on a clear speed, and 
I, well, I have now more examples. I don't know how are we in time. Uh, we have till? 12. Till 12. OK, fine. So uh, another example for uh, Cholesky. OK, I've mentioned it before, I think. And what is the, compared to matrix multiply, what is the characteristic of Cholesky? Is, is the task graph is a little bit more complex, OK? You have the dependencies are a little bit more elaborated, more complex, it's triangular, there's not, not uniform all over the time. Well, this is the type of Cholesky code that a numerical analyst would understand, OK? If you try to represent that, you do that Cholesky computation with, with other approaches, you take OpenCL, or it will get a little bit more complex than this. In our case, it's just this, this type of code plus the specification for each of the, these functions, the specification of which are the inputs and which are the outputs. Okay? For the pragma, for the size, can you use a variable or it has to be a customer? You can use a variable. The programmer can put here, yes. So you can. You A64, the 64 can be a block size variable. Yes. Yes, yes. Can be a block size. I think I have some other examples before. Afterwards, the type of. I think I have some examples that we show the type of methodology that we think, I think would be, would be interesting. LU. Well, LU and Cholesky are very close friends, yeah? Anyway. This, this is a slightly different version. This is an LU, but it's sparse. It's still stored by blocks, but some of the pointers, some of the, blo some of the pointers are filled, some of the pointers are empty, okay? So the algorithm, and probably this is one of the questions that was made before about uh, what if the dependencies depend on the data, yeah? If, and this, this is the situation. Sometimes you have, you have here conditionals if, that block does not exist, I don't have to do this computation algorithmically. If that block does not exist, I don't have to do that computation. So the dependencies are actually, if I don't do the computation, I will not be producing that data. So if somebody is, the, is, is then needing that data, there will not be, the, the dependence will not be with me because I've not done, done this computation, it will be with whoever did produce that data long time before. So it's, it's just to show the, the idea that the parallelism can be uh, found at runtime on situations where it depends on the input data. In, and not only the parallelism, there's another thing characteristic of a sparse Cholesky or sparse computation, and is that you have filling. Actually, your logical address space, the, your logical data, your input data grows, your, well, the, your data grows with the, as you proceed in the, through the computation by by, by generating new blocks that were not in the input data but appear because of the structure of the computation. And this is, in this case, this is represented in this way. If at a given point in time you find out that the situation arises that because of the two given blocks in the original matrix you have to combine them and create a new block which initially was zero and now you have to give it a different value, you can, that was not in the original data representation. You can still, during the program, create that. And you can still, that will get into the, mechan the whole mechanism of computing the dependencies. So it is a way of yeah, influencing, so that the, the way of computation influences not only the dependencies, but the, the data that is there. Probably the question before was, a little bit even farther away about what are the dependencies uh, that depend on the computation. These are dependencies that depend on the computation. Well, rather than depending on the computation, they, they act, this depends on the structure of the matrix. And we have not changed the structure of the matrix. So the, there are things that are identified halfway through the computation. You identify that you need them. But uh, you can do, we can do this because it depends on the on the structure of the of the matrix. It does not depend on whether the actual value of one of these operations is a is is a three or a five or a seven. Okay, so it's only partial partial uh, uh, partially addressing what I what I think was the the, the original question. 
but it's one level of addressing that if you want to do this type of things with a normal programming model for for any accelerator type of device i think it, it will you will suffer a little bit okay you had mentioned some features in the runtime, like uh, trying to maintain locality, uh, being able to prepare time and so forth. So in this example, your data is uh, indirect. Does it uh, break those features, or do you have a great way of working on this? Uh, no, the data is indirect also, and it's indirect by blocks, which is... Yeah, so there are some codes, some programs. I, I, for example, the original one that we worked, uh, where all these ideas arise, I mentioned at the very beginning. This was paralyzed in a finite element code equivalent to Nastran. It's a European code, PERMAS. It's a million lines of code. And that code was already like that. Okay? Was already data was stored by blocks. Many other codes, you, your data is not stored by blocks. It's stored in the, sta in the standard row-wise or column-wise memory association. And, and uh, yeah, that is, that is a little bit of a problem. So in this case, I will address before afterwards, but in this case, uh, these blocks is sparse. So these blocks are, are are contiguous. So it doesn't break the locality. What you have to what you what happens is that you bring one block to your device, you bring the other block to your device, and still there may be another computation. So here, so you do you do a computation between this the output of this of this task and a computation of the output of this task. As far as I can tell, the, uh, the input to that DAG node uh, is not the data itself, it's the uh, pointer to the data, in my, in my Right, opinion. right. So uh, then with, with the existing logic, you would only be uh, prefetching the reference itself, not the... No, 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 you're referencing the, the runtime is, is, is bringing the object itself, not, not, not the reference. Yeah? You are bringing the object itself. Yeah, no, and that's, that's, that's. Another uh, example or another idea of, of behavior that happens is you typically never have just this is my LU and, and that's it. You have your LU as part of a program, and that program. This is a stupid, silly program that we've written where you generate a, matri a couple of matrix matrices, you multiply them, and you keep a copy of that matrix in order to do now a decomposition of that matrix and compare whether the decomposition and the originals yeah, are the same. So it's a very silly, but just to mention that typically your program goes through several phases, through several steps. And what, what I want to stress is two things. First, well, so you do the comparison, you split the matrix A and L into U. You then, after splitting the matrix, which was, this was a decomposition in place. After splitting the matrix into two matrices, you do the multiplication of these two matrices and the result should be the same, apart from numerical errors, should be the same as the original matrix that you had initially. Okay? So then you do a, a, a function that compares the original matrix and the result of this process of decomposing and multiplying again and you compute the, some, some measure of mean square error or something like that. Well, at this point, the main program before printing whether the result was good or bad, you have to wait for this mean square error, okay? So this is, this is again, a wait on at some points in order to synchronize your, your program. Your main program computation stalls and then the whole thing goes on. What I want to say here is each of these functions, so this is a function, which internally will be implemented in a block way, in a, as a block algorithm, and will be creating and generating tasks of different, different nature. For example, this will be using a clean block task, which is, will be a task that will clean one of these 64 by 64, let's say, blocks. This will be a multiply, a copy, and these are the tasks internal to the LU decomposition. You can split blocks or you can compare blocks. These are the individual basic instructions. So what happens at runtime is that you go through here and you do a whole unroll of the whole dependence graph, irrespective of whether you are in one routine or one other. The program just goes, if you didn't put this, this, bar, this weight here, this program, I mean, limpack would be something like this, yeah? The result would not, grad, would not validate, yeah? But you would arrive here immediately. You have unrolled the whole 
Essentially, you have unrolled the whole program. You have unrolled the whole program, and you have a graph that is something like that. And in this graph, some of these tasks are generated here. Some of these tasks are generated here. And when you traverse that graph, you traverse it just satisfying the dependencies. So this is an example of a timeline. This is the very end of the timeline of, of the execution. And what essentially happens is, well, as long as you do some of these tasks, so you keep, you can be doing this. Why, why th this is part of an LU decomposition, OK? This is a still part of an LU decomposition. This is another part of an LU decomposition. Essentially, it's the decomposition of the very low end of the very last blocks of the, of the algorithm. These are, this is a splitting. This is comparing the result of the, of the, of the, the com you, you compute the LU, you split it, you multiply, and you compare to the original. Well, you see that at the very end, you have a comparison. But since the last uh, part of the decomposition, since the last task of here, till the very last task of uh, here, execution, uh, till, uh, till they have been executed, the time is, is really very, very small. So what I mean, yes? So in this model, uh, you, you keep a sequential semantics for the main program, then you choose this data dependence graph. And the symptom, uh, but a task will not generate more tests. So it's a centralized scheduler. So when the number of process is large, for example, clusters, or even many core, will the scheduler, a centralized scheduler may fail to keep all the processes busy? Maybe. And there's an issue between granularity and overhead. And we have, I'll show you, we have overhead. This version has overhead. This is version one, has some overhead. Let's say on the cell, which is a very bad processor, the main processor is about three, four microseconds, OK? It means if you have eight SPUs, you have your granularity of, all of your tasks have to be 20, 30 microseconds in order for the master not to be a bottleneck. In, on a normal processor, the overhead of this version, the overhead of creating, maybe half a microsecond, one microsecond, which means in order so you, you can fit probably three, four more times more processes, uh, processors. But that, that is certainly a problem. The question is, in a, in a, in a homogeneous multicore, you don't need to have tasks of 64 by 64. You can make them larger because have access to larger memory. So you can, you can play a lot. What I mean is you can play a lot with granularities. Okay? And, and is, uh, is, well, you may complain. It's, it's, I think it's, it's, it's something that one has to, to look at, to, to perceive. But in my experience, my situ my, our situation is overheads are, in, in general, not a very big problem, not a very, as long as you can tune your granularities and you can have granularities of, of, this, of, of decent sizes. And as long as your overheads don't get, don't go into the critical path. If they go into the critical path, they are, but if you can overlap them, they are not such a big problem. The numbers I showed you for, for the, for the lean pack, SMP superscalar lean pack beating the, the MPI, on 64 processors, yes, it was on 64 processors. All the work was generated by only one. And, and still, you are able to beat it. So it's a matter of how you set your granularities. In some cases, it's true that if your algorithm, your tasks have to be, have, are very, very fine granularity and you have no other way of increasing that, that is a limitation. But that would be a limitation also if you have a cluster or whatever you have. It <coughs> would be a, a I mean, even you choose the granularity very well. But uh, let's say if you have a cluster with uh, tens of thousands of nodes, just to jumpstart all the right. processes from a single master is going to be like, right. start time. Is going right. To be so the situation there is we are implementing this cluster superscalar version. So I don't, I don't know. I have no good idea of what will be the granularities that we will able be able to support and what will be the number of processors that will be able to support. Uh, you're right. I don't know, and I don't expect it to be thousand. I expect it to be maybe thirty, maybe. Nevertheless, for for the thousand way or the hundred thousand way of, of of course, the type of programming model that we propose is you use as of today. You have existing codes. They are MPI. What we propose MPI plus stars, and I will be show, talking about that in a minute. Well, not in a minute, but in any case, I think we are doing some work looking for uh, the help of the architecture. How we change the architecture in order to manage efficiently this runtime. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
But now the runtime is run in the general purpose process. It was a problem with the first uh, uh, running you did with the with the cell. Remember the, the process was very slow. I have what you say. But now we have a, a PhD student working on how we can implement this sub super scalar runtime mm -hmm. in hardware. What can you tell them? Yeah, because you, when you think about the super, real super scalar processor, the decoding and the fetching is actually in parallel. So the rig, yeah. in hardware it's in parallel, but the, when you do a software centralized schedule, it becomes sequential. Yeah, dealing with this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I still don't understand why why the data dependent control flow will not affect your data dependent one. The question that um, the other person asked. Why then? So, so you, you build the data dependent graph based on input outputs. Yes. Right? But in the body, if there's a if else, then yeah, I don't understand. No, no. If you have a you have a control flow things, you have to as of today, you have to do you have to do this. You have to you have to stall as of today. So we are kind of replicating the the processor design things, uh, issues. So in, from that point, that point of view, our current implementations today are the state where you had no, no, no branch uh, predictors, where you had no, where you just stall whenever you have a branch, okay? If your, if your branch, the branch, if your branch depends on, on data that has been generated by the tasks, if your branch does not depend on that, you keep going, okay? But if, you, if your branch is conditional on the data, our implementations today are not at, are just at the level of uh, no branch predictor, no nothing. We don't don't speculate, okay? We don't speculate. You could. Do you need at the level of granularities that we are looking at? I'm a little bit skeptical, but again, it's another area where we can really work, investigate what is the the the, perform, the the benefit of that. Another example is NFFT, and this is probably related somewhat also. If you do NFFT with a, so you start with an array A, a 2D FFT, an array A, and then you use a temporary, a temporary array, you can first do all the FFT, for example, NFFTs by rows on several rows, and this is your task. This is one task that does FFTs on, on, on several rows. Then you transpose, for example, one way of transposing would be one task to take all of this and put it there. So this would be the transposed tasks. But what happens is that the dependencies in this case, this guy is touching this part of data, this guy is touching this part of data. The data is, this part is contiguous, but this part is strided in memory in the, with the normal. Now this is with the normal association of, of data, okay? The row-wise association. This is strided. So the ways of computing dependencies that we have in version one would not work. And uh, the aliasing is not perfect because it's not total because this, this thing does not allies. I mean, there, there are some, some arguments, some parts which are shared the same, some parts which are different. Our, our version one dependence checking mechanism would not work. So if we have these situations, you have to put barriers to enforce. It's kind of a stalling at that point. You execute till that point and what, what you get is you actually empty the whole state of your machine and you start again with, okay? And then you can start kind of a new phase where your representation of, of the objects can, can now use the, the other type of, the, the other representation. So this is, this is the, the same code where the transfers are done block by block, let's say, okay? There are, oh, sorry, there were the, where the transpositions are done, block seven and block seven are transposed in, a, in the same task. Well, this is again the barriers for, for achieving that purpose. Even though the behavior is, is, is not bad, this is again running on an Altix, up to 32 cores, and the behaviors are, are relatively interesting in some cases and depends, this is what we use for the, for the innermost FFT, for the actual FFT, we can use either FFTW or MKL, and the behavior is different depending on which one we use. In some cases, our, the approach that we follow 
actually because we can cert certainly the product we follow does have still good uh, some potential of, of improving compared to the even compared to the original ones okay we have tried different versions and different versions are uh, in this well the data here is distributed all over the machine so it's a very numa machine but the data is distributed all over very much all over so there are things whether variants whether you in the task do bring bring your data to a local buffer allocated locally in the task or not but uh, the, the results are here are interesting. Probably I will go to the ah, to the to the Cholesky. But before the Cholesky, let me just go to another example. This is this is an example in, in OpenCL that we have taken from from the OpenCL uh, examples distributed by IBM. This is the source code of an OpenCL of an OpenCL. Uh, black skulls which does option pricing which I don't know what it is okay anyway it's just uh, a program which uh, taking out comments taking out some checks of returns code uh, of return uh, values of, 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 of control values for the correctness of some of the calls and uh, some checks of what are the block size supported by a specific device the main program end up, ends up being this thing, okay? This is the main program which runs on the host. Then you also have the device, the device program, which ends up being this thing. Well, actually, either this and this, or this and this. There are actually two two versions, okay? So this is is not the three of the the three boxes. It's just two of the boxes, the the orange one and one of the other two. So how? Did we transfer this program, this program into stars? This is what it takes for the same program to be written in stars. It's a program which is extremely parallel. It's just a, a parallel loop, a parallel OpenMP or a parallel for all, for all loop. It's, it's extremely parallel. We have taken the instead of taking the kernel from OpenCL with the distribution also comes the version which is not OpenCL, which is just a standard C code. So we have taken that version and we just invoke it. And this is one of the things that the question about the, the block size, whether it has to be 64 or, has, or doesn't have to be 64. This is an example, for example, essentially you, you are treating a, a set of rows of a matrix and you compute in the loop itself, you compute, you compute the actual size of the blocks, how many you want to, you want to process. Okay, and you compute that in every iteration so that this, this loop works for any size of the of the array. Okay, if not, if we were to put only a fixed value, the array should be a multiple of that value. If you compute it, you, what you have is you have typically, let's say, tasks of, of computing 128 rows or 60 rows or 64 rows, whatever it is, and at the end, you have one task that computes only the remaining the remaining row. What I want to stress is that the same code of the task, because the t code of the task is has one of the arguments is the size of the data, and this size is used all over here to specify what is the size of those arguments. The same source code, the same source code is valid for any such sizes. And even if within the same application, some parts of the application use a block size, and some part of the application will use a different block size. Okay. So this is the code run on SMP superscalar, which can run on a standard multi-core machine. The question is, this can also run on the cell, for example. The question is, how efficient would it be on the cell? And the reality is, this code you just feed it as a standard C code to, to the to the cell compiler, to the backend compiler for the SPU, and this code is is very very inefficient. Okay, so what would be would we be interested? We would be interested in in leveraging and taking benefit of the code that somebody has already written in in OpenCL, which ends up being efficient for the device for the CP, for the SPU ends up being very efficient. And the question is, can we leverage it? And it's just a matter, the answer is yes, and it's just a matter of, instead of using the standard C code, we use the, the OpenCL kernel, only the computation part of the OpenCL kernel. And the only thing that you have changed is because, well, what is the, the, one of the 
from my point of view, one of the key advantages of, of OpenCL is the data types, the vector type, kind of float by four, integer by four. Is is the is the place where you get, let's say, compiler, a backend compiler, obtain high performance in a machine which has long registers or has long long uh, operands. Okay. So it's between this code, which was the original for SMP, and this code, which leverages OpenCL, there is a little difference. And the little difference is just that instead of going one by one through the different rows, okay, one by one, you have to go four by four, which is the block, the block size, additional level of block size that the typical OpenCL kernel would have. But the idea, what I think is important, is that you can leverage code in OpenCL. You can leverage code in, in, other, in other programming models. For the part which I think we, we don't try to go into optimizing the usage of the specific device. We think, for, for example, for that OpenCL is a good approach, or, or HMPP, or, or you can use the native CUDA uh, code for that. Just uh, to mention the performance of such a, such a code, and, and we have two plots. We have run the, such a code on the cell, the same, the same source code. In this case, now it's, it's totally exactly the same source code because we have a, a, an OpenCL compiler for the cell, and we have an OpenCL compiler for an Intel from AMD. Okay? So the same source code, we run it on the cell, and we run it on the Intel, and we compare it to the OpenCL original code provided by IBM. And we have, let's say, let me take, this is, these are the two original versions of OpenCL. And they have relatively bad times here. And the bad times essentially come from uh, one thing, which is the size, this uh, local work group size. This is a decision that is made by the, by the machine, by the runtime, by the OpenCL implementation, rather than by the user and ends up being very fine grain. Okay? We actually use that very same size on a, on the, because on the cell superscalar version, because we can compute the block size, and as I said before, even in the same program, we can use different block sizes for, for the data structure. We can access the initial part of the data structure with large block sizes, and we can access the final part with a small. We could even use kind of the equivalent to a guided scheduling in OpenMP. You could use the, the similar type of thing. Okay? So we, in this case, we did, we did the code with a very small block size, and that's what we observed. For example, that our cell superscalar overhead, and this, was mentioned, this is what was mentioned before, our cell superscalar overhead, if the block size is very small, kills you. And that version of cell superscalar behaves bad. Okay? But if your block size is, is a little bit larger, and it can be larger, then the performance of the cell superscalar version is, is actually better than, than any other versions with OpenCL. Okay. This is here on the cell. Same source code running on, on Intel. You have again the, the serial code, the OpenCL is the orange OpenCL, and you have the, the, the stars sources. And actually, you, we have tried the stars. And we have tried it with uh, with the with the Nanos compiler, with the, the Nanos and uh, ah with with uh, yeah, sorry, we have tried a version because the loop is totally parallel. So we have tried it with just the the OpenMP4 parallelization, and we have tried the 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 task-based parallelization with dependencies, and in this case, even the task-based parallelization with dependencies is a little bit a little bit faster. Well we did something similar to other to other of the benchmarks of the of the codes in this in that distribution. And uh, some of the things that we found, for example, this was the this was for, for this other code, this was the the execution uh, so the the performance. Higher is better here. In the other one higher was worse lower was better, here higher is better. So this is the performance, and this is the OpenCL version. This is the orange is the, the cell superscalar version if you use GCC as the backend compiler for the, for the device, and yellow is the performance if you use OpenCL for the device. 
Okay, so the, the result is, or this, the, our perception is that, or what we found is that OpenCL has ended up to be a very good backend for, for, the, for the SP processors in the cell. Okay, and that's from that is from where you get the performance. The big difference in performance between this version and that version. And the same source code run on the on the Intel machine gave a slightly slightly strange result. And I don't really know at the moment whether that's caused by the in this case here what we saw is on the on the cell, the GCC compiler and the OpenCL compiler for the backend were very different, much better the OpenCL. In this case, ends up that the GCC is much better, significantly better than the OpenCL compiler. Okay? And it's it's a it's a strange situation. One could try and go and find out why that the compiler the compilers the different compilers behave different on different machines. From my point of view, the idea or what, what I think makes is more interesting, what would be more interesting is related to, uh, well, it's, it's not really heterogeneity, but it would be nice to have the different versions, so the, the binary of the task being compiled with both compilers being fed to the system, and the system at runtime decide which of them is better. Okay, That would be a very nice type of uh, functionality that can be could be implemented into the into the stars model. And we will talk a little bit about that later. But it was curious to find out one example where this does happen. And does happen in these cases we don't need two implementations of the of the same task of the same uh, building block. We need just same source code for uh, pass it through two different compilers. Again yet another example which I'm not I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. Spec Fen 3D is a finite element code. And what we have here, what we did was we obtained a kernel of that finite element code. And this is very typical of finite element codes. You have sparse accesses here. You read data from a structure that says, for example, the displacement, the positions of your, of your nodes. You read data which characterizes or the, uh, group the data corresponding to one element. You do some computation on that on that element, and then with the result of that computation, you have to update the accelerations. Okay, and these accelerations are are by nodes, so are with the same association with the same layout as the original. So you need a gather, compute, and a scatter. And this scatter is with reductions because it may happen that some other element from here also updates the same position. Well. Then after after that there is also a need for with with the accelerations you compute the velocities but this is for every point with its acceleration you compute its velocity so there is no no gather no no scatter no strange pattern it's just uh, the same position of the vector and with the velocities you com you compute displacements and with displacements you are still he again here and you you iterate you repeat the you repeat the process this is essentially the structure of the code There's this for loop, which is the number of steps that you iterate. One thing that you typically do, what they typically do is they, they do check the stability of the numerical method from time to time. Essentially, there's, you check the stability as every certain number of time steps, you do a check of the, a check of the stability. A check of the stability, which depends on the actual positions of the particles, and this what we have done is in this case is this we have converted into a task which is and you'll see the, the typical practice that we suggest always you compute the size of the task the size of the object and you compute you say this is the size and this is the pointer to the beginning okay the actual task of the compute max is like is, is here so you have the size oh I, I this is a typo I should delete this this is the size and this is the and this is the displacement, the vector. And the vector is 
of this specific size. Okay, so this this task can be valid for not for 64 by 64 can be valid for any real number, and you can actually invoke that task with different values depending on which set of nodes you are treating. Okay. Well, in this case, this is computing a max. You have a reduction here, and because of this reduction, and you are interested in this in this value in order to determine whether you want to, con to to finish or to continue. And this is, in our current implementation, this is a stalling. If we were to do, we could be doing what we said before about uh, uh, speculative execution. We would, typically this will not happen, so this would be a branch that would be easily predictable, and typically we would be able to continue. We don't today, okay? Well, more things. After that, what you do is, again, similar thing, you update the, you update the, the velocities and the acceleration, and uh, this is what I represented here is just to see the dependencies. You, this is a, a you produce the, an output. In red, I put the outputs, and in blue, I put inputs. This this whole block is called from here, and what happens is the way you produce outputs and the way you access to the inputs here, we have this. This is gather process, okay? So the dependencies of this gather process are relatively complicated, okay? So what we end up doing, we end up putting these barriers for checking those, those dependencies. Well, the rest is just, just to show the outputs and input, and input that, that, that we have here. It's, I don't think it's necessary to go into the details and the task. You can, I mean, you have the slides, you'll have the slides if you can look at that. But essentially, the, the, this is just, again, the structure, the general structure, this is a reduction, and then this is a, a timeline of what happens here in, in, re, green and, in green and yellow. You have the tasks that execute this part, these things, which are, in the source code, the, these vectors are traversed like this in execution because of the locality, sta the locality scheduling. Just, this is just the typical thing that the... The, the typical work still in from seal would, would, would work. The locality study, st scheduling essentially executes them like that, okay? So in order to save, uh, well, to reuse the data. Then you have a barrier, and after the barrier, again, you have the gathers, the computes, and the scatters. And the system, again, executes the gathers, the computes, and the scatters in, in sequence, okay? And this is the speed up that you get on a, on a given platform. One of the, this is another example which addresses the issue that one of the problems of, uh, one of the problems of, uh, of the, some of the examples that we have put before is that the data was a kind of hyper matrix with pointers to the actual, to the actual objects. So in reality, many applications are not that way. So what happens if in reality the applications are the standard row ways and uh, standard row ways uh, association and you want to compute you still do algorithms. You can still do algorithms by block, okay? But the, the algorithm by block is you are blocking the the you are blocking the computation space. You are not blocking the data space, okay? Well, one way of approaching these situations would be just on each operation of the blocking the computation, on each block operation on the computation space, to do something like translating from the original row-wise association to a block association. You could put some, some and this in this approach is user level would put something like a translate, which would be translate, which would be transform and which would be uh, grab the data from the original row wise association and store it in my block wise association. So you could do is do this type of things by hand as a programmer. These type of things, each of these things can be done as a task. So the whole system, the, the, this will be done in parallel because the system will, essentially this, this task will be copied to shadow, let's say, and copied from shadow, okay? And this task will be executed, they have their inputs, they have their outputs, and they will be executed overlapped with other executions. So essentially you will unroll this graph, and this graph among the things besides the computations, there will be parts of the graph that will be doing those copies. But it's true, 
it does require a new data structure, it does require that you do, that you do the, the transfer. And you may say, well, this, we may complain, this is too much storage, okay? Well, but these routines could handle that storage as a catch, okay? There is no need for that. Oh, I don't have the, I'm missing one slide. Okay, that storage could be handled as a catch. You don't need to have here as many blocks and pointers as necessary to, to handle that. You could actually have some of the as a sparse matrix and pointers being null, and if you have already filled a sufficient number of blocks, this routine could actually handle that as a catch, could be actually uh, flushing or transferring back to, to the memory the original value and getting, checking, getting in, this is kind of a load. This is, this is equivalent to a load, conceptually, okay, in the ISA that we mentioned. So that would be one way of handling it. It's probably a little bit cumbersome for a user and it's not the solution that we think should be applied. The solution that we think should be applied goes in the direction that the system automatically does that for you, okay? Which will also increase the overhead of the system, but uh, we will talk about it later. So I think I'm about to finish this first part with another example in, in examples in another area. This, this is a typical program for processing a file. In a typical program like that, you read a block into a buffer, or part of a file, you process that block, and then you write the output of that thing, okay? Then you read, process, write, read, process. This is a typical sequential program. And typically the read, well, the read is, is something that may take very short or may take very long, depends on whether data is on the file system cache or not. So it's, it's relatively random. The process typically would take a significant amount of time and the write again, we are again with something which is very random. If you taskify this, these functions, you say, for example, the read is something that uh, essentially something that uh, produces the buffer. Okay. The process is something that typically gets the buffer and produces the buffer out. The write is something that gets the buffer out and from the local point of view it doesn't do, just sends it to a file, but the, we are looking at the internal view inside the process. So you can taskify it and you can say for each of these tasks, what are the inputs, what are the outputs? The dependence graph of that thing is like that. The, the, the read, the process and the output. And you need to enforce a serial depend, uh, serialization of the reads. You cannot make the reads out of order. You have to read the file sequentially. How do we do it? We do it by saying the input file descriptor is an input output argument, okay? By saying the, the file descriptor is an input output argument means that the tasks that work on it will have to be done in sequence. Similar thing for the write. Okay, so this is also DOM, the output file descriptor is an input-output argument. The system actually doesn't touch physically, the, the, the program doesn't touch physically that, that variable, but by saying that the dependencies are built such that this will be serialized. What other problem do we have? We have another problem in that when do we know the, whether knowing if, 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 if we are at the end of the file, of the file or not, we need, we have this conditional, we have a control flow dependence, we have this, this while depends on the output of the, of the read. The while depends on the output of the read. In the read actually we have, we have put here that the read tells us whether we are at the end or not of the file. In order, so we can actually launch these things, in order to proceed to the next iteration we need to have the read finished, okay? So we are stalling here, we, we go to the next iteration, stall, go to the next, stall. And the question is, does this execute in parallel or not? Okay. And the result, the result is this. This is when this has been run with four processors. Now the, diff the colors are the same. So read, process, and write. When it's executed with four processors, comes out that at the beginning, you see the reads and writes get very much interleaved. And the, if you zoom into that, they will, the dependencies are satisfied. They will never be 
two rights, two reads at the same time. There will never be two writes at the same time. But reads can process, proceed very fast. Writes can proceed very fast. It's, it's very dynamic. And the, actually, as I said before, the duration of reads and writes is very dependent on the file system. It's, it's, it's very much out of the control of the programmer. What happens is actually what, what is happening is, is, is actually the system is actually doing renaming this, this read. This read, the buffer it produces is an output buffer. Okay? So the, the runtime essentially for every instance of the read allocates a new buffer and reads into that new buffer. As a result, if the read proceeds very far, what it's actually doing is generating many such buffers. But the program does not see them. The buffers are there, but they, they are handled automatically by the system. The program is kept simple because you could have written that yourself. You could have done some type of scalar expansion, and you could have done it by yourself by hand. I think the interesting thing is that is you don't need to do that by hand. Your program can be kept simple, and this is dynamically adapted by the runtime, uh, and you, it generates as many buffers as needed. Okay, so oh yeah, we have the zoom. You have, we have the sum of the area, and you will see there, are, there may be, here you have several reads, one after the other. There's one read that goes to this process, but you never have two reads at the same time. In the same way, you never have two writes at the same time. Okay? And you traverse that computational space in a very dynamic, very flexible way. Other approaches for doing this, OpenMP or whatever it is, would have been really, I mean, there's no way of, of achieving that, that easily in OpenMP. And, uh, well, we have n-queens. I think we are more or less where I want it is at the start of version 2, which is the one that supports the, the alias the references. If we are in time for lunch, if you have any question, we'll stop for a while now. So your, your example with the, the file read and write, right, it's not purely functional because right the file is related to OS data structures. What mm -hmm. happens if you have such code? Does does the runtime make any detection of that? Or if you try to run it on like the, the GPU model or the cluster model, does it just fail? So the from the point of view of the of the process, the state that you what you put into the file system, you are you are actually changing global state, but from the, the our, our let's say the programming model looks at the state inside the, the memory address space that it has, okay. And from that point of view, that is is not a problem. Essentially, we are serializing, and uh, I don't see a major problem with that the, because the, the order of execution of the task is is, is consistent with the, origin, the with the sequential program order of, of the of the program. The problem would be if you have what has been mentioned before, if you had exceptions, okay. From that po at that point in time, maybe there would be some pro might, there might be some problems. Not in this case, for example, because if you have an exception or something fail, you have not actually updated because you have serialized those those operations. The, the exception, if, if the exception is a write, some some problem is in a write in, in a file system write. Okay, uh, the, this file system gets full or so, some something. Uh, well, you have not done the ones that go afterwards. So the behavior would be the same as you would have on a sequential program under the same, under the same situation, under the same conditions. Okay. So from that point of view, I don't see that the problems are different for, for those of the of the original program in this case. In general, if you can have things happening out of order here, and some of these things affect global state, which is out of the so the, the runtime system only checks the global state in the in the in the local address space. Okay, if you change a state global state outside like file systems, then uh, that would have to be looked at or considered. Typically, but in in our case, the typical way of doing that is is by introducing these these dependencies, these serialization dependencies. Is it? More or less clear, no? Okay, because we're taking this, we probably have to stop and then we continue at one thing. And we have the lunch boxes here and uh